If you were here last week, you heard Rob articulate that we want to recast or re-explain, if you will, illustrate the vision of Zarephath Christian Church. And what it is is that we have a vision. You hear these catchphrases, love is Jesus love, lived is Jesus lived, serve is Jesus served. You see the banners on my left and my right, love, live, and serve. And this is our vision. You look at those, and two of those are tennis terms, aren't they? Which two are tennis terms? I think love and serve. It has nothing to do with tennis. This is our way to articulate and cast goals for what we want to accomplish, what makes our church unique, and what is it about our church that gives us a reason to be. Obviously, the Great Commission, obviously worship, obviously the Bible, studying the Word and, and preaching the Word. But we truly want to be a church that loves as Jesus loves lives our lives as Jesus lived his, and serve others as Jesus served. So for the next three weeks, including this one, we're going to focus on each of those three words, each of those three topics. So for today, mine is love. I was given the task of teaching about what it would be like to love as Jesus loved. And so let's pray and, and enter into this study through scripture. Lord, I thank you for the ability to come together and to look into your word. I pray, Lord, that as we do, that you'll illuminate it to us and show us what it means to love as you loved and give us a, a, a glimpse of your life and how we can apply the, your teachings and the word of God to our lives right now here in February of 2015. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the Directive for each of these three are laid out in our vision statement. And I'll read the first one to you, and we could look at it on the uh, screen as well. And to love means to lead children, youth, and adults into a deeper love of God through vibrant worship, prayer, and a passionate presentation of his word at weekly worship services. And that's what you're experiencing right now. And second to that is to honor the word of God by hearing, studying, and applying it in our daily lives while demonstrating devotion to God and love for one another. And so we have to ask the question, how can we love as Jesus loved? That's a pretty tough one because Jesus was the champion of love for all time. I mean, it's like, like if we look at these basketball nets, if I told you, I want you to play basketball like Michael Jordan played basketball, that would be easy compared to trying to love like Jesus loved. Because Jesus was an embodiment of God who is love. God is love. We learned about that a few weeks ago. But he sets forth the priority of love throughout his life. And we looked at this a couple weeks ago as well, that Jesus puts that hallmark, the word love, higher than any other word that we can have. The directive to love God and to love each other are the two most important things that he taught us, but the most important things in the Bible, most important things to God, which makes them pretty important, isn't it? I'm going to look at it in Scripture. We're going to go back to that Scripture in Matthew 22, which was sort of a showdown, if you will. It was towards the end of Jesus' ministry, where he, it was sort of the culmination, and he was developing quite a following of believers. It was intimidating the Pharisees, it was intimidating the Sadducees. They were afraid of his popularity, his amassing multitudes that really believed that perhaps this guy is the Messiah. And so they were trying to trick him. And they, threat, they sent three waves of attack to, to attack Jesus verbally, to try to trick him so he'd say the wrong thing. And if he said the wrong thing, he could either get executed or he would, have diverse, uh, he would disperse his crowd. And at the end of these three waves comes that utterance of truth about the importance of loving God and loving each other. Matthew 22, verses 15 through 40. I'll go through this in different rates, so put your seatbelts on. Sometimes I, I read scripture quickly. <laughs> Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested, along with the supporters of Herod. These are the Herodians. To meet with him. 
And teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You're impartial. You're impartial. You don't play favorites. This is all false flattery, by the way. They didn't believe these things they were saying. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You see, if he gave the wrong answer about taxation, paying taxes to Caesar, if he said yes, give Caesar everything he wants, well, then he would have ostracized a big part of his crowd, which were tax revolters. They were uh, the oppressed, the zealots that felt like the taxation that Rome was putting upon them was completely unfair. And yes, it was. Rome would take as much as they possibly could of your crops, your grain, your work, whatever it is you produce, they would take it and leave you a little to support your family. They knew, the Jews knew, that this was unjust. And if Jesus went this way on that, on that issue, he would have alienated that crowd. But if he said, no, those Caesarean taxes are very, very corrupt, then he would have found himself in a Roman jail and probably executed for that. Quick answer to a very tricky question. He said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used to pay the taxes. And they gave him a coin. They handed him a Roman coin. He said, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar and to God that which belongs to God. Verse 22 says, his reply amazed them and they went away. That was the Herodians. Next come the Sadducees. That same day, Jesus was approached by some Sadducees. The Sadducees are like Pharisees in the temple, temple leaders, experts of the law, but believed differently about the resurrection than the Pharisees. Pharisees believed that, you know, you die and there's some type of afterlife. The Sadducees believe that you die and it just ends there, you see? That is why they are so sad, you see? <laughs> That's not mine, okay. <clears throat> These are religious leaders who say there's no resurrection from the dead. They pose this question. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who carries on the brother's name. Well, suppose there's seven brothers. The oldest one marries and then died without children, and his brother married the widow, and the second brother did the same thing, the third brother, and then they continued all the way down the line, all seven, verse 27. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her, they're asking a question about the afterlife that they didn't even believe in. This is all, again, tricking him, trying to trick him. And Jesus came up with a brilliant response. He said, your mistake is that you know the scripture. You don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they'll be like the angels in heaven. But now, as to whether or not there will be a resurrection of the dead... Haven't you read about this scripture? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said, I am. God said, I am, currently am. Meaning that God is present tense, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. Well, verse 33, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. That was wave number one, attack number two, and here comes the third and final attack, which produces the greatest statement, I believe, in the New Testament, my opinion. Verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees and his reply, they met together again. They huddled again, as, as Marlene said, they huddled. And one of them, an expert of religious law, tried to trap him with this question. So they sent out their guy, their expert. And that expert went out and says in verse 36, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Seems like a very harmless, benign, ordinary question, but it wasn't. They were trying to make him say something, again, that would alienate the rest. If he said the most important thing is to keep the Sabbath, then all the non-Sabbath keepers or the others that believe that something else, honoring your mother or not stealing or not murdering, there was a lot of commandments, and each faction had a favorite, and you pick one, and guess what? You lose the rest. This is what they were trying to do, or to get him to say something that was heretical. And once they got him to say some heresy, they could arrest him and try him right there and then. But he responded. <clears throat> Verse 37, and Jesus replied with this statement, 
you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two things. This is why I say these are the two most important points in the Bible. Because Jesus said them, love God with all you got, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said all the law, that which was written before, and all the prophets, that is what is to come, bases them or hung on or rests upon or are contingent on or based on these two things. The law and the prophets, these two things. And he even went on, he even went to say that these are equally important. To love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and might, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so you may say, well, I love God a lot, but I just have a hard time getting along with other people. So I'm a God lover, but I'm not a people person. <laughs> it can't go that way. They're of equal importance. 1 John 4.20 says, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And so when you want to ask the question, how did Jesus love? How can we love like Jesus loved? The answer is right there. To love God with all your heart, strength, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we do it. And now, you have to say, well, where did Jesus get this from? Did he just make it up on the spot? Well, partially because he is the word that has become flesh. But the first statement that he makes is from the Shema. The Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Shema is a part of a prayer, a preamble to a, a Hebrew prayer that takes place in every synagogue and temple throughout the entire world every single Sabbath or Shabbat. Also, Orthodox Jews pray every day. They pray the Shema every day. They start with the Shema. And they say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Elonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kavod, Melchuto Leolam Vayed. You hear that in every synagogue? That's the Shema. And what it means is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And then it goes on to say, you shall love the Lord with all your heart. You shall love the Lord with all your mind. You shall love the Lord with all your strength. This is where Jesus got this from. It was a very important part of their Hebrew liturgy at the time. So his answer to the question was in their terms, a, a scripture that already existed. And the second one was not far behind because while it wasn't one of the more liturgical popular scriptures, it came from Leviticus 19, 18, which actually says, love your neighbor as yourself for I am the Lord. Again, part of the Tanakh, part of the Torah, and so Jesus spoke to them with scriptures that they knew, but he re-enlightened them and reprioritized them. Love God with all you've got, but also, and they might not have expected this, love your neighbor as yourself. And so for us to live like Jesus lived, to serve like Jesus served, but also to love like Jesus loves means loving God with everything that's within us and loving our neighbor as ourself. Now, who is your neighbor? Is your neighbor the person that lives next to you, <laughs> sits next to you in your office? Is the neighbor the person that's sitting next to you right now? Well, it could be all of those things. Sometimes it's hard to love your neighbor. Sometimes their dog barks early in the morning or late at night. Or they come home late and they're laughing and talking loud and you're trying to sleep and the car horn goes off. And it's hard to love your neighbor sometimes, isn't it? Well. When we have to define who is our neighbor, Jesus used some wonderful par parabolic uh, liturgy, narratives, to, to give us that point. In Luke chapter 10, we hear the story of the Good Samaritan. This is a story we're all familiar with, and it helps us to identify who our neighbor is. The Samaritan was a man, most likely a Jew, going from Jerusalem to Jericho, the road to Jericho, which was a, you know, maybe a day's journey, but it was kind of marked with a lot of peril as you go through the Judean uh, countryside and the hills down to the Dead Sea area where Jericho is. There's bandits and people that would rob the people that went back and forth. And this particular man got robbed and beaten and left for dead. 
As he's lying there, a priest goes by, says, whoa, I don't want any part of that, and keeps walking. Another Levite goes by and sees him, doesn't want anything to do with him. Then a Samaritan, one of the more maligned people who don't normally have anything to do with Jews, comes and says, I want to have mercy on this man. He, he cares for him the best he could. He puts him on his own donkey. He takes him to, to a place that would care for him. He pays for his care. And so Jesus asks the expert of the law who he's telling the story to, he says, who is this man's neighbor? And the expert of the law says, well, obviously the man who showed mercy upon him is the neighbor. And Jesus said, yes. And so he, de he defines that each one of us can show mercy to anyone, even if they're not in our people group. And that person is your neighbor. And to love your neighbor as yourself is a very broad, very inclusive directive, to love the people who need God's mercy. And the Lord will put them in your path as we walk. So love God with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. To love as Jesus loved means to love who Jesus loved, love what Jesus loved. And I just want to point out three ways and people and, uh, and individuals who Jesus loved in Scripture. Just three. He, he loved everyone, but in three different ways that he loved. The first one, obviously, he loved God. Jesus loved his Father. Jesus did anything the Father asked of him. So to love like Jesus loved, we need to be able to do that as well. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it means being at odds with our own institution or our own friends or our own comfort zone. You know, there's certain times in Jesus' life where he acted seemingly uncharacteristic of Jesus. For the most part, he's telling people to love one another. He's sacrificing. He's healing. He's doing miracles. But once in a while, he does something, and it's like, that doesn't seem very Jesus-like, but he, what he just did. Why did he do that? If he did it, I guarantee you, it's either because of love for the people or love for God. Let me give you an example. In John chapter 2, he's walking through the temple, and he sees corruption taking place right there in the temple. They're, they're extorting. They're selling at a high profit things that are needed for temple worship and making all kinds of money. They're changing money at an at a unfair exchange rate. There's this going on right in the temple, which is designed just to worship God. And Jesus looks at this, and he drives them out with a whip. He knocks over their tables. That doesn't sound very loving, does it? Who is he loving by doing that? I'll tell you who he's loving. He's loving God. He says, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. He loved God so much that he was willing to stand up for justice in God's household. How about this time? What about the time where... Peter is saying to him up in Caesarea Philippi, Peter's saying, you know, I want to protect you. I don't want you to go and be, be crucified and, and, and arrested and all that. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> that doesn't sound very loving, does it? The, Jesus had just laid out for Peter, who had just been enlightened about, you know, who the Messiah is. Jesus has just laid out, okay, wow, I want to tell you the most important thing and precious plan of God for my life. And that is I'm going to go and to, to, to go to Jerusalem, be given over to the hands of the Gentiles and crucified and die. And Peter says, I'm not going to let you do that thing that you just described. But that thing that he just described was the most loving act of kindness in the world. And Peter wanted to, ignorantly, but he wanted to block it. And Jesus said, no, I love God and his ultimate plan for my life, even more than I love the words that Peter, good old Peter, is telling me right now. Or how about this? There's a time when Jesus had to love God's will above his own will. There's a time where Jesus said, not my will. Father, if you are willing, take this cup of suffering. Remember this in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's facing suffering. He's facing the cross. And he says, if you are willing, Luke 22, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not my will. And so to love God as Jesus loved God, sometimes 
Very often, we have to say to God, your will, not mine. That's love. Remember what love is defined as selflessness. Sin is selfishness. Love is selflessness. Be selfless to God. I want to do your will. I want to sacrifice my time, energy, attention for your purposes. This is true love to God. And Jesus mastered that in everything he did. He loved God. The second, how do we love as Jesus loved? Love the church. The church? Yes. Jesus loved the church. In fact, oftentimes when we do weddings, we pull right from Ephesians 5, where Paul's describing how precious and beautiful the love between a husband and wife is and should be. And who does he describe and what does he describe as the illustration? Jesus love for you, for the church. Ephesians 5.25 says, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. He calls us his bride. Guys, I know you want to be tough and macho, but you are the bride of Christ. <laughs> we as the church collectively are the bride. Not just Zarephath Christian Church. We're just a small group in the big church worldwide. But we are the bride of Christ. The called out ones, the believers. He loves us. He loves you. In fact, at the end of time, in Revelations 19, we hear this, beautiful words that are uttered and come forth. Then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a, of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Verse 7, verse, chapter 19. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. And this is the presentation of Jesus receiving us, the church, his bride unto himself. And so you may say, well, hold on. I'm not, I don't really like the church. I don't really get along with Christians. But I love God. But I don't really like the church. I'm anti-church, but I'm pro-God. Again, I have to remind you, 1 John 4.20 if someone says, I love God but hates fellow believers, that person is a liar. And this is true for the entire church. You can't say, I love God but I don't love the church. This is impossible. You know, Jesus loves us. We're his bride. We're not perfect. We're not, we have a lot of flaws. We have, believe me, through the ages, the church has blew it. But we are his bride. And he looks at us lovingly and with forgiveness. And I believe Christ, Christians, the church as a whole, is the m most beautiful and wonderful group of people on the face of the earth. I can't imagine what the earth would be like if there were no Christians. Someday we may see what that's like. Who knows when the rapture might take place. But if you said to me, Raphael, I like you. You're a good guy. You're cool. I think you're awesome. Your wife, on the other hand, I don't like very much. <laughs> In fact, not only do I not like her, but she's kind, she's kind of a jerk, really. And so I'm all about you, Raphael, but none of that, Allie. Bring back, I don't want anything to do with Allie, but I love you. I would say, well, you don't really love me. I mean, come on, you have to put up with my wife if you want to put up with me. <laughs> Actually, she's the better part, you know, the better. <laughs> I remember one time I was living in Nashville, and I, was, I dropped off my car to get fixed, and my wife had to come and pick me up. And I'm sitting there with the mechanic waiting for my wife to come. And uh, finally she pulls up and she gets out of the car and looking all beautiful as she always does. And the guy looks at me and looks at her and says, son, you overmarried. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but you know what, from time to time it, it hurts me because I, I see back to the issue, 
I read, I come across an article or a blog or a sermon or, you know, an open letter to the church telling the church how awful we are or, or pointing out all the problems of the church, making fun of Christians, making fun of the church, ridiculing, lampooning, you know, criticizing the church and telling how the church is blew it and is out of step. And, and, and you know, these get a lot of attention because we, we, we do have some flaws and they're harping on, piling on how the church is, is you know, it's, it's not relevant enough, it's too old fashioned, it's intolerant, it's not slick enough to attract unbelievers anymore. And you hear it over and over again. And I wanna tell you something, this does not please the heart of God. People say, well, it's the truth in love. Whoa, be careful how you use that term, truth in love, until you really know what love is. Oh, I'll remind you what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. It's not jealous, not boastful. It's not rude. So if you see a rude letter that's written in love, it's not written in love. It's written in criticism. It's written as accusation. If something's of love, you'll know it because it will scream of compassion and tenderness and gentleness and meekness. And if it's overcome with rudeness and arrogance, delete it because it's not of God. Love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God and he that doesn't love does not know God for God is love, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. In fact, there is one who constantly accuses the church, constantly criticizes, constantly brings into account all the terrible things that we do and we've done. And he shows up in Revelation 12. Revelation 12 says this, verse 10, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. The devil doesn't need any help. He does a pretty good job of criticizing us and condemning us. He doesn't need your help or some author or blog or preacher or writer or anything else. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves his church. He looks forward to the day where he welcomes us as his bride, radiant, washed in the word. So if you love like Jesus loves, guess who you'll love? Like it or not, you'll love the church because Jesus loves the church. And then the third and last thing I want to point out is that Jesus loves the lost. He loves the lost. He came to seek and save the lost. Now, through scripture, we see how he would come across a leper and he'd, out of compassion, just heal the leper or the blind man, even raising the dead in, in an instant. He gave himself to those who were destitute or lost. It doesn't necessarily mean they were always poor or always a beggar or always a leper. He did that as well. He wasn't only going to the poor. In fact, when he collected his 12 apostles, he didn't pick beggars and lepers. He picked a nice cross section. One guy had a government job, Matthew, the tax collector. A couple guys had their own fishing business. He just collected people like you and me. But they were sent out to reach out to the lost, to seek and save the lost. In fact, when he went to Jericho, he goes to Jericho and he invites himself over to the house of the shortest guy in the Bible. Who's the shortest guy in the Bible? Someone said Nehemiah. No, that's not it. <laughs> Zacchaeus. <laughs> in Luke 19, he goes to Jericho and he sees Zacchaeus up in a tree because he's too short to see Jesus over the crowd. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to go to your house for dinner. Well, Zacchaeus was, had a terrible reputation. He was a tax collector, a sinner. He was one of the ones that worked alongside Rome to extort money out of the Jewish population, out of the Jewish farmers and the Jewish workers. And he would be the one to collect for Rome. And if you didn't give him what Rome wanted, he'd tell the Romans and you would be in big trouble. He was a snitch. He was sort of an extortionist. That's what Zacchaeus was. So Zacchaeus is invited, I mean, Jesus invites himself to go fellowship with Zacchaeus. And what did people say? Well, they said, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And Jesus' response to them was, the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus was lost. All of us are lost without Jesus as our savior. And as I told that young man, Dan, in the hospital, 
That's why Jesus suffered and died. If we could make it on our own, if we could do enough good deeds to outweigh our own, uh, outweigh the bad deeds, if we did enough, enough mitzvot, as we say in Hebrew, or tzedakah, that we could outweigh the scales and earn our way to heaven, Jesus wouldn't have to suffer and die. Why would he do that? If we could just do enough good things. So he went to seek and save the lost, and he died for us. Romans 5, 8 tells us God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so to love like Jesus loves mean, means giving and offering the, that sacrifice that Jesus paid for all of us to those that need it desperately. John 3, 16 is the building block of our evangelical scriptures. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life because God, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but he came to save, that the world would be saved. So what we want to love like Jesus loved. Look at his life. Jesus' whole life and death was an expression of love for the lost. So in review, three things. To love like Jesus loved, we must Love God with all we've got. We must love the church because we're his bride. He loves us. If you want to be like Jesus as well, you need to love the lost. And how do we do that? How do we play basketball like Michael Jordan? How do we love like Jesus loved? We have a secret, and that is this. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit fills our lives, as we live according to the Spirit, as we come away from the things of the flesh and lay hold of the things of the Spirit, this, we are infused with l the love of Jesus Christ. It just pours out of us. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but Romans 5.5 5 gives us that secret and says, God has been poured out into our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit by his love. Another version says, God's love is poured lavishly upon you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So friends, you and I can do it. We can love like Jesus loved. We can live like Jesus lived, and we can serve like Jesus served. But it's through the power of the Holy Spirit.